Funding for this program is made possible by Burke Nursery and Garden Center in Burke, Virginia. You'll find trees and shrubs, perennials and annuals, water garden supplies, house plants, and bird and gardening supplies. Burke Nursery also provides landscape, plant diagnostic, and installation services, as well as the October month-long Pumpkin Playground Festival featuring hayrides and much more. For more information, you can check out their website or call 703-323-1188. Welcome to Gardening with Burke Nursery, the show where we help you grow your garden and increase the curb appeal of your yard. I'm your host, Ms. D. Kacharis, the horticulturalist at Burke Nursery and Garden Center. Today we're going to continue talking about low-light houseplants. As I mentioned in the previous show, here in Northern Virginia, we have a lot of older homes with mature trees. And you can't always get a lot of light into your home because of those trees. So for that reason, I call many of our homes shade houses. And that means the interior of your home has low light. So you may think that you can't grow house plants, but the truth is there are a lot of plants which will grow in low light and enable you to bring the beauty of nature indoors. So as always, I get questions from people in the audience, and I also get questions from customers at the store or my own clients. And a question that Tom posed was, I've read that houseplants can improve my health. Is that true? Well, Tom, during the last episode on houseplants, I talked about the benefits of houseplants because they remove toxins, such as benzene, TCE, and formaldehyde. And that NASA actually conducted a research study behind the findings. Today, I want to discuss some of the research that indicates not only are houseplants good in removing certain toxins, but they can also increase productivity in the workplace, reduce stress, and improve your health. So, in 2014, the University of Exeter released the results of a study that they conducted in England and the Netherlands. They monitored productivity levels in two large commercial offices and found that houseplants increased workers' productivity by 15%. Even studies in Texas and Washington State showed that workers' productivity improved by 12%. Plants in the workplace increased workplace satisfaction, concentration, and also better air quality. People felt happier. Now, a University of Technology study in Sydney found that anxiety was reduced by 37%, depression by 58%, hostility by 44%, and fatigue by 38%. So many of the studies on houseplants are conducted in workspaces, but there was also an interesting study conducted by Tom Barnacle for his graduate thesis at the Southern Illinois University Carbondale, part of which was written in the 2003 issue of Hort Technology. He found that seniors in long-term care facilities improve their well-being when involved with horticultural, meaning gardening, activities. So I could go on and on about all the various research studies that show how important it is to have houseplants in your home and other locations, but now I want to continue to share other low-light plants and how to care for them. Tom? I hope that this answers your question. If you're interested in some of the websites that list these results, or have any gardening or lawn care questions that you would like answered on this show, just email me at misty at burknursery.com. Well, this may be a repeat if you saw the last program, but before I go into the houseplants I want to focus on today, once again, I just want to let you know 
that when you go to your garden center and you purchase a house plant, please remember that by moving that house plant from one location to another, you're giving it a little bit of stress. So when you bring it home, let it be. Don't repot it immediately. Wait about a week or two. And also, what I have in front of me right now is a snake plant, which is a succulent. So snake plants, other succulents, cacti, they're actually the exception to this rule. But generally, when you bring a house plant home, what you want to do is water thoroughly so that you set the clock. The other thing is that you want to keep your house plants, especially your succulents, away from drafts. That means don't put them near your air conditioning vent, don't put them near your heating vent, don't put them near a door that you're going to constantly open in and out all the time. And also fertilize, and fertilize with either a 10-10-10 fertilizer or a 15-10, I'm sorry, a 10-15-10 or a 5-10-5 fertilizer between March and November. Plants go dormant in the winter months just like, indoor plants go dormant in the winter months just like your outside plants. So that's why you don't fertilize them during the winter months. All right. Well, what I'd like to do now is talk about the snake plants. Snake plants have several names. Their common name is Sansevarius. Years ago, uh, before we got um, a little more thoughtful about it, they were called mother-in-law's tongue. But now we actually refer to them as snake plants. And there are two varieties. This one is known as or what I like to call it, I like to call this the sword variety. Because this one reaches and grows tall, it grows compact, it can get three to four feet tall. And I could not find any pictures to show you, but when these plants get very, very old, the sword-like snake plants actually do get little white flowers. The other snake plant is what I call, and actually what a lot of botanists will call this particular snake plant, is the bird's nest snake plant. And this one, I don't know how well you can see it on the television, but this forms a rosette. So this particular plant will never grow tall like the sword plant, rather because it grows in the form of a rosette, this will grow only about six inches tall. Excellent plant for not only your office, not only your home, but it's also an excellent plant for those dark places in your home where you don't get a lot of sunlight at all. They just thrive in very dark places. Here's a little bit of trivia about the snake plant. The snake plant is also called the bowstring hemp plant. The reason being in Africa, and specifically Nigeria, what the individuals would do is they would cut off parts of this plant, they would rub it until they got fibers out of the plant, and they would use the actual fibers from the snake plant to create strings for their bow. It can be a fun thing to do, but actually I don't recommend that you do it without gloves. If you want to see if you can get those fibers and make little strings, be sure to wear gloves. Be sure that you take the gloves off and don't touch any parts of your face, especially your mouth or your tongue, because the sap which technically it's not sap because it's a house plant, but that the, um, we'll call it sap for lack of a better word right now, can actually be very poisonous if you were to consume it. So if you want to try that experiment to see if you could create your own hemp bow, uh, bow strings, just do it with caution. 
And because it's a succulent, it needs very little water. So make certain that you dry this thoroughly before you water it. Snake plants can actually be a lot of fun to propagate, meaning creating little baby snake plants. And to do that, first, because I talked about the sap or, or the ooze of the snake plant that can become poisonous, you put on some gloves before you do this. And any rubber gloves, I prefer to purchase the rubber gloves that are nitrile. They are, um, some people are allergic to latex gloves and I also find nitrile is a better protection when it comes to any kind of toxic substances. So what you would do is you would cut off a portion of the snake plant and you would cut off any portion of the stem you can go as short as three inches, you can go as long as four inches. Then what you do is you moisten, and you have in this pot, it's soil, uh, potting mix, just standard potting mix. You moisten the water, and then you just take your little slices of the snake plant, cover the snake plant with any plastic wrap. Oh, and I, if I, now I can't remember if I mentioned, but make sure that soil's moist. Then you cover it, and you'll start seeing, in a, in a few hours, you'll start seeing moisture and moisture droplets on the top of this plastic wrap and leave it there, it'll take about three months, but in three months, you'll end up having roots. What I would recommend is that to test it to see if you have roots in three months is just pull gently on it, and if, if it tugs and doesn't let you pull very easily, then it, it has the roots, and if it's the only snake plant portion you put in this pot, you can leave it in this pot, or you can repot all your little snake plants in other pots. A plant that can make an incredible statement in your house is what we call Chinese evergreens. Here are two different types. And there's also a new type that unfortunately I didn't have in stock, otherwise I would have brought it with me, that actually has green and red leaves, and that one came out a few years ago. The China, there are so many different types, but they all have some form of variegation. Again, variegation is where you have white and green, I mentioned yellow and green, and with the Chinese evergreen, red and green. These leaves alone can grow two feet long. I'm not talking inches, I'm talking feet. And the plant can be anywhere from one to three feet tall and one to three feet wide. So this one is a little more erect, meaning it isn't quite as wide as it is tall yet. This particular Chinese evergreen is pretty much getting there as far as width and height. And occasionally they flower, and when they flower, their flowers look like peace lily flowers. And then after they flower, they can occasionally get berries as well. And it's interesting because some horticulturalists say, don't let them flower because we don't like the berries. That's your choice as far as how you want it to look, whether you like it with the berries or not, but if you don't like the look with the berries, then don't let it flower. These plants will grow almost anywhere. They tolerate low light, they can be in dry air, and remember when I was talking about not putting your plants in an area of a draft? The Chinese evergreens are exceptions they can tolerate being in front of an air conditioning vent. 
they also do well with drought. So what you do when you want to water these is you let the top of the pot dry out. And then that you'll feel some moisture below the pot, or rather in the pot, but then what you do is that you take the and water it. So you just want to keep it moist. And what I'm going to do is take these gloves off, which I had on earlier in the show. The other thing about these plants, most of your tropical plants actually like humidity. Well, these are plants you never want to put in your shower. They do not like humidity. So that's why these plants can actually do very well in an office situation because a lot of the offices don't have all that humidity. What's very important when you do repot your Chinese evergreen is that they have very shallow roots. So you don't want to put them in a very large, deep pot. Eventually, you'll need to put them in a large pot, but you want that pot to be what I call shallow. And then when you repot it, you can think of them almost like a hosta. When it's time to repot, if you'll take a look, I think you can see it better with this larger one, that basically it looks like you have three plants in this one pot. Well, in actuality, you could. Because if you wanted to repot this, you could actually separate this into three plants. And then one other thing about the Chinese evergreen. As the plant grows older, the lower leaves will start actually to brown and eventually they'll just die off and you'll end up with what starts coming up almost like a cane. It's not quite a cane, but basically you'll have a lot of the leaves at the top of the plant and you won't have that much at the bottom. Well, if you don't like that look, what you can do is you can take all of these leaves you can cut them, and you can put them in water and root them, and end up with an entirely new plant. So consider the Chinese evergreen if you have a place that's dry, and especially perhaps in your office. Previously, I was discussing the Chinese evergreen. And what I said with the Chinese evergreen was that occasionally it gets a flower, and it gets a flower like the peace lily. Most people know the peace lily plant. It's a very common house plant, with the exception of when the Chinese evergreen blooms. This house plant, the peace lily, is the one that basically about the only low light plant that will bloom. It will grow one to four feet tall and one to four feet wide. And there is a peace lily house plant called Sensation that will actually grow six feet tall and six feet wide. So if you want to make a statement in a low lit area, definitely consider the peace lily. The other thing is that the peace lily is actually not a lily at all. But it was named the peace lily because the, fla because the flowers, to a lot of people, resembled flags that people wave when, they're, when they want to have peace and they want the war to stop. Now, the peace lily, when you're watering the peace lily, it needs to be moist. And again, not soggy. So the best way to do that is to let the top of the peace lily, and it depends on the size of the pot. These you can plant in very large pots. So you may want it in a pot this size, which this is a six inch pot. I would go down to about one inch, and if the top is dry but one inch is moist, then I would maybe wait a few more days, then I would water it. 
or if I was in a large pot, I would go down two or three inches to see if it's still moist and then determine maybe water it in a few days. On the other hand, there are people that will actually let the peace lily dry out. They'll let the leaves wilt from getting dried out. And they tell me that their peace lily does fine that way because then they water it and make sure all the water goes all the way through. Well, if you find that your leaves are turning too yellow and wilting too much, then that strategy really is stressing your plant out too much and it really doesn't like that strategy. If your plant leaves start turning brown, then that means just the opposite is happening. You're overwatering it, or your house is way too dry because peace lilies, like a lot of other plants, they like to have a lot of humidity. And the best way to make certain that the peace lily gets its humidity is to either get yourself a humidity tray or to create your own humidity tray. And the humidity tray has some ridges and grooves and when you pour the water in this humidity tray, make certain that the water does not go over the top of these ridges that you see in the center because when you set the plant down, you want to make certain that your plant is not touching that water. And if you decide to use some river rocks or some marble chips and put them in what I personally prefer to call a pot coaster, then make sure again that the water doesn't cover all the rocks so that when you put the plant on the rocks, that the plant is elevated above the water. And then finally, another way to make certain that that plant gets humidity is with your spray bottle. And when you spray, never spray on the leaves. Always spray above. Let it believe that it's back in its own forest where it grew so that that way it feels the moisture and it feels rain as if it's coming down. Oh, and the one thing that's very important with any of your large leaf plants, I mean any plants, but especially your large leaf plants like your Chinese evergreen or, and your peace lily, dust them. They collect dust, so make certain that at least once a week you take out a soft cloth and just dust them. Otherwise, the dust will clog the pores and they won't be able to breathe and you'll have problems with your plants for that reason as well. And one of the major questions that I get about peace lilies is, what do I do after these flowers have bloomed? If you look at the flowers of peace lilies, here's the flower right here you'll see that the flower is on a stem. After the flower is bloomed, and you'll know it when it's done because it'll be brown, then what you do is you go to the base of the stem, as low as you can go, and you cut that flower off at the base of the stem. Peace lilies are ornery, meaning that they don't have specific time periods for when they decide to flower again. If your peace lily doesn't reflower in six months, then what you want to do is take it out of the low light setting and put it in some brighter sunlight, but not in direct light because you don't want to suntan the leaves. And leave the peace lily in the brighter sunlight for a month or so, and then you will see new flowers coming. As we wrap up, I'd like to share with you one more low light house plant. And this is the fern. This is something that a lot of people don't consider. They think about it when they think of woodlands and they're outdoors. But if you want to have plants in your bathroom, then very much consider the ferns. They need a lot of moisture. They need a lot of water. They need a lot of humidity. 
You can even buy some small ferns that will work beautifully in the terrarium. The other nice thing about ferns is that they have so many different leaf shapes. So you have your fern that looks more as if what you'd see outside, and then you have this maidenhair fern that has little leaflets instead of the more arrow-shaped leaflets. And there are even some ferns that are long leaves and just make a beautiful statement if you want to do what I call plantscaping in your yard, it can, or rather, in your home. And it can create a lot of whimsy. The only thing, while they need a lot of water and a lot of humidity, then whatever you do, make sure you don't let the pot sit in water. By letting the pot sit in water, what could happen is that they would start turning yellow and they would start wilting. Just spritz your plants with the sprayer above when ready and you're all set. So I can't say enough about the importance of houseplants. And with the low light plants available, the choices are greater than you thought. I'd like to thank you for spending your time with me. I'm Misty Kacheris, horticulturalist for Burke Nursery and Garden Center, and I'm looking forward to helping your garden grow. Funding for this program is made possible by Burke Nursery and Garden Center in Burke, Virginia. You'll find trees and shrubs, perennials and annuals, water garden supplies, house plants, and bird and gardening supplies. Burke Nursery also provides landscape, plant diagnostic, and installation services, as well as the October month-long Pumpkin Playground Festival featuring hayrides and much more. For more information, you can check out their website or call 703-323-1188.